Hi everybody, uh, this is just a continuation of the last video um, explaining the plan of salvation. But I'm making this video because I want to clarify a few points that I uh, probably didn't touch on, touch on enough and, and made it uh, clear. So I just want to do that uh, right now. Um, by the way, I know I laid a lot on you on that video. There's a lot of information there. That was not my intention, uh, but there was no way to explain uh, all of that in a simple and concise way uh, because there's so much there. And even that, that hour and a half, is a short version. It's not a detailed Bible study. I only gave you just the, just the, uh, the crucial verses just to prove my point. But there's, uh, there's wealth of verses and passages that will support uh, what I've said and, and, and make that um, presentation of plan of salvation complete and, and, and it'll prove it. Um, but I want to just, and I know that many people out there will probably misconstrue and misunderstand what I said because it doesn't fit their theology. And I understand. And it's okay, um, even if they misunderstand. Um, because it's, it's, it's always been like that. And truth is always, sometimes, always hard to take in and always hard to swallow. Um, always, you know, the Bible sometimes gives that theme gives that concept of that bittersweet experience you know like uh, and the and, and the taking in of truth is certainly like that it seems very bitter it seems so hard to accept but when you accept it it's so sweet in your mouth and it's and it enriches your soul and uh, liberates your mind um, so I hope that when you listen to the messages or any future message, this message or any future message, I hope that you receive it with an open mind and an open heart. That perhaps you're a person with great knowledge and great faith. And, but leave room that there's a possibility that some things that you have believed up until now it could be it could be wrong it could be mis it, it could be misunderstood leave room for that i'm not saying give up things that you believe okay but sometimes put things aside put it in a compartment so that you have room in your mind and in your heart to receive new things and just like the bible says prove prove it to see if it's true and, and test the spirits, right? Check and fact check and check again. Make sure this is the truth. But have an open mind so that you have room to be able to contemplate these things and search for yourself and allow God and allow the Spirit of Christ to reveal to you the wonderful things that God has in store for you. And if you do believe what I just explained to you, God bless you because you have take a, taken a huge leap into understanding what Paul calls the mystery of God. This mystery that the secret weapon that God has hid for ages in order to release it at the opportune time to destroy the dominion of Satan and to save his people that he loves, his sons and daughters that he cares about. He did that in Jesus Christ. Anyway, the concept of the two Adams 
I didn't elaborate that on very much. But I'll just say a couple of more things to help you to understand. It, the concept of the two atoms, what the Paul is trying to illustrate with the, that, the, that analogy is that it's a too big contrast. Adam was made perfect, directly created by God. But because of his sin and his rebellion, he fell. And he brought upon the human race, upon us, death and destruction and misery in this life. Okay? He brought that upon us as a consequence of what he did. Yes, we are all individual sinners too. I know that. I want to make sure I put that disclaimer so that you don't accuse me of uh, uh, trying to teach you know, original sin or something like that. Yes, we are all individual sinners too. But the sin problem, the origin of sin in mankind happened because of Adam. And all the things that have, ha have come because out of consequence, it came from him. And he, his sin condemned the human race to a certain state and a certain destiny that we could not escape from, no matter what we did, whether we lived a righteous life or whether we lived a, an extremely sinful life, it wouldn't have mattered because we are in a fallen state and a fallen nature. And we cannot be saved in that way. And if you know the scripture, and if you know salvation by grace at all you know that that's true okay but the big contrast is that the second adam who is jesus christ was made a quickening spirit life-giving spirit to be a solution for what adam first adam created in that great problem jesus became the solution. He reversed the process. He reversed the consequence of his disobedience that Adam caused. Does that make sense? Jesus Christ is the last Adam. There's a, not going to be another after him because he provided the solution to the problem that the first Adam created through his sin. That's why Paul is making that analogy. And that solution is that, the problem is that we lost life. Correct? We lost life. We don't have life. Our destiny is death. So the solution is Jesus Christ, another man, a holy and righteous man who recreates the human life to give it back to us so that we can have eternal life. And that's the analogy that Paul is giving. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's so amazing that I know some of you out there is going to have a hard time believing it. I did too in the beginning. But my desire was so... I was so in tune to wanting to know the truth that it spoke to me in a very powerful way. And I couldn't deny it because it makes so much sense. It fulfills... You know, Jesus focuses on the rebirth, right? He's always talking about life, okay? Rebirth, born, being born again in the spirit, okay? Your flesh has to die and you must be born of the spirit. God is a spirit, so you must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's always focusing on the spirit and in the rebirth because... In this condition, in the flesh, we cannot be saved. 
the popular idea is that somehow Jesus can make our old self into new. Okay? To be sanctified and to be made something that God can accept. But this is a concept that is foreign to the Bible. Jesus did not teach that. Jesus said you must be born again. Jesus said a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. It's not about the fruit. It's about the tree. If you have a good tree, good fruit is automatic. And if you have a bad tree, it doesn't matter what you do. It's going to bear bad fruit. So you have to what? You have to kill the bad fruit. And you have to become, I'm sorry, you have to kill the good bad tree and become a good tree. Out of the abundance of the what? The mouth speaks. The heart. If the heart is corrupted, Everything is corrupt. Jesus told the Jews, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside it's dirty. You're like an open sepulcher. It's beautiful on the outside, but full of it. It's inside is dead men's bones. He wasn't saying that to just to be mean to them. He was trying to make a graphic point to let them know that you're in a state of death. It's full of death. You're full of death inside. So in order to live, you have to change. You have to be reborn in the Spirit. So the rebirth. We were talking about justification, righteousness. They when they make these arguments, they forget about the rebirth. You die to your old self. You don't try to fix the old tree, bad tree. You put it to death. And you are born into a righteous life of Christ. And through His indwelling Spirit in you, You are justified. You are sanctified. And you are glorified. Because of Jesus Christ living in you. He brings those things to you as a gift. And you just have to behold it by faith. It's always about faith. Let me make an analogy. When the Israelites were about to cross the Jordan the first time at Kadesh Barnea, they did not, did they not cross the Jordan because of sin? Did they? Of course not. They were sinners. They sinned all the way from Egypt all the way to the edge of Jordan. They were a pain in the butt. And God had to deal with them again and again. And it was such a chore. But God did not take back His promise of giving them the promised land. He did not. Even though they sinned over and over again. And idolatry and worshipping golden cows and images and, and stealing stuff and all these things. God still said, you're crossing the Jordan. But you were to cross the Jordan by what? By faith. By faith. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, they weren't even supposed to fight for that land. Do you know how God was supposed to drive out those people? If you read carefully, by hornets. 
Gao was going to send them a gigantic swarm of hornet to drive them from the land. Okay? Have you ever had one hornet chase you? Have you? One hornet will make even the strongest and the mighty person run like a little girl. Okay? God was supposed to send the hornets to drive out the people. The Israelites didn't have to fight at all. But they insisted. They disobeyed God. They insisted, send the spies to spy out the land. And God had to give in and say, okay, do it. But it's not good for you. And it wasn't. The 12 spies went, spent 40 days, came back. Only Joshua and Caleb made a good report. The other 10 went around the whole camp and told everyone, no, we can't take that land. The sons of Anak, the giants are there and they're going to crush us. Oh, what, why did God bring us out of Egypt? Let us go back to Egypt. Let us kill Moses. And Aaron. And go back. Pick a leader. Another leader. And go back to Egypt. They didn't cross the Jordan. Not because they were sinners. They didn't cross the Jordan. Because they didn't believe. The lack of faith. And so. God, had, God was forced. Dad had no choice. But to have them wander in the desert for 40 years. And even that was not out of spite. Because I was so angry. God had to make sure that generation who didn't believe. Had to die in the desert. So that they don't infect the minds of the next generation. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense, right? It's unbelief. It's unbelief. Let me read you. That passage I spoke about in Romans 5. And it's a little long, so bear with me. But just hear these words and think on it carefully. Because it will prove to you exactly what I'm talking about. About Adam. About the two Adams. Romans 5, starting from verse 12. Wherefore, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed on upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Oh. This part I will explain later about our relationship with the law and, and how sin and law works in our lives. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, meaning Jesus Christ. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. Okay? And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Now, constantly, Paul is talking about Adam and Christ, Adam and Christ. So is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, Adam, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification, Christ. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, Adam, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men, through Adam, to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. You see these words that Paul is using to help us to understand? For as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Jesus Christ, by his obedience and his life, reversed what Adam did. Except what Jesus did is far greater in grace that covered the wrong that Adam caused. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow. That is amazing. I, I can spend hours just analyzing that passage. But basically, Paul is saying is that because of one man, Adam, we became condemned. We became, we were facing death and destruction. But because of the work of another man, through him, through his obedience, through his work, and through his life, and through his spirit, many will be made righteous. But the secret is, it's his life. You have to be born into his life. Just like Adam passed on his life to us, which condemned us. We have to be reborn into the new life in Christ in order to escape that condemnation to a new destiny that is free from death and condemnation. Beautiful, amazing, astonishing glory to God. I touched on um, Hellfire a little bit, but that'll be for another study. Um, that's actually a very interesting study as well, and you're going to be very surprised by it, uh, as I already gave you a little bit of a preview. Um, and the comforter, that's the last thing. That may be the hardest thing to accept, uh, that Jesus Christ, his life is the comforter. Um, I won't say too much of it at the moment, except to say that the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit, of course, has always existed. There's mention of it in the Old Testament and, and, and littered throughout the Bible. But that Spirit of God is always the Spirit of God okay and in the Old Testament it focused on the power of God's Spirit right the prophets like Elijah um, Moses um, and all the prophets when they were Saul even Saul when he came over with the power Spirit of God they had mighty power and they can do amazing things right so in the Old Testament, it focuses on the power of God. In the New Testament, not so much. It focuses on something else. It focuses on the creative aspect. Creation or life-giving aspect of God's Spirit. And the reason why the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Comforter in the book of John. And he's the only one 
that mentions what happened in the upper room. It's very interesting. The reason why the Holy Spirit is special after the glorification of Jesus Christ is because before God's Spirit was just God's Spirit expressing His power and glory. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ that He imparts to you is different now because it contains His human experience which was not available before. You understand? The Spirit of God now has victory over sin, victory over death, and pure goodness and love that conquered and defeated Satan. The life of Jesus Christ is in the Spirit. And that's what Jesus gives you. A new life through His Spirit. So that you are completely made new. What does Paul say? When you are in Christ, you're a new creation. All Things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. These are not just figurative language, brothers and sisters. This is a spiritual reality that you are in Christ. You are a totally new creation. I know KJV says creature. But the right translation is creation. You're a new creation. Jesus recreated the human life to give to us. And when you are in Christ, that recreation, that new human life is yours. Is yours. And you must take it by faith. Receive it by faith. Holy Spirit, that seal of the promise of God. That is the life, the very vitality of a Christian life. Without it, you have no life. There's no point. It's no different than, like the non-believers say, any other religion. It's just all theory and good vibes and a good story and, an, and, 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 and figurative language and representation. No. Christianity is a dynamic, powerful, and spiritual and practical, amazing transformation of the human life through the Son of God. And Peter says we will be kings and priests, a royal priesthood in Jesus Christ. Paul says we are the ministers of the new covenant. We are ministers. We are intercessors. We can take this message and go out and save souls because the power of Christ has, has the ability to convert souls mightily. If you believe, this message will change people's lives. You will change people's destinies forever. That's why you have to have faith. You have to believe God's word. Add His word and not doubt. 
Jesus Christ will help cross the Jordan. Let me finish that analogy. You remember when Moses was there the second time in Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy basically means the do-over, okay? With the second generation, they were going to cross the Jordan. And they eventually did. They had some trouble, but they eventually did. But Moses didn't take them across the Jordan. And I know the Bible says it's because of his sin, because he struck the rock and he disobeyed God and misrepresented God in front of his people. I know that. But there's a greater, there's a underlying symbolism there. Because what, what does Moses represent? Moses represents the law. And human works. Okay? As great of a man he is, he represents the law. And that cannot take you to the promised land. And I think, this is my own personal analysis. But I'm just giving, sharing it with you. I know he sinned. But I, his punishment was just too harsh. Moses said, please let me go over. Please let me go over. And God said no. Not only did he say no. He said, go on top of the hill, mountain. And look at all the land that you're not going to be able to <laughs> possess. And see. I, that's that's too much, right? God forces him to look at the land that he's not going to possess. And um, in the book of Jude, it talks about how Moses, there was some trouble trying to resurrect Moses. And there's some evidence that Moses was resurrected to enter into heaven just a few days later. Okay. Why did God put Moses to death only to resurrect him within a very short period of time to go to heaven? Why couldn't he have let him live to just see the promised land that he struggled with Israelites? Do you know what Moses went through with the Israelites? Have you read the Old Testament? Wow. It says Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. Bible says that because oh, you have to be humble in order to deal with the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. I think the reason why Moses didn't cross the Jordan because Moses represents the law. And who ended up leading the Israelites across the Jordan to the promised land? Joshua. And you know Joshua is the same name. Jesus. Yeah, Yeshua, right? The Hebrew name. Yeshua is Jesus. And Jesus represents faith and righteousness. And that's who led the people of Israel across the Jordan to the Promised Land. This analogy is very important. Because it shows you that human righteousness and human works and justification through the law, you cannot enter the promised land. You enter the promised land through faith. Righteousness by faith. And this passage that I just read in Romans chapter 5,
that even though before Moses gave the law uh, it's saying that before Moses gave the law there was no law and Paul says sin is not imputed when there's no law which makes sense like if you don't tell people what is wrong of course you can't charge them for sinning because they don't even know what sin is right but it's the point is they didn't know the law and the sin god doesn't impute sin without the law and yet death still reigned from adam to moses that's what paul says why is that why is that it goes back to what i was saying before even though those individual sins were not imputed to those people before the law came from adam to moses they still died their babies still died innocent people still died because death reigned because of the original fall of adam he brought death into the world is paul is saying so it doesn't matter it didn't matter what those people did or didn't do their destiny was the same death ruled the world and satan had a perfect record perfect record remember what the analogy i was giving before satan had a perfect record up until jesus that it's right that these people die because they're sinners so they need to die and that was his accusation and he was right every single time until jesus broke that curse I'm going to finish it here. I really appreciate you watching. And I thank you for being patient and listening to everything. Please meditate and contemplate on everything that I said. Go check out those verses and chapters and read them carefully and prayerfully. And ask God to help you to understand. These are beautiful truths that's going to deepen your faith and bring you closer to God and it and when you understand it and you feel it you're gonna see the way you see God is gonna change and you're gonna fall in love with him and in my prayers I say a lot of times father what else can I do? You, you've stolen my heart. What else can I do but to fall in love with you? There's, how can I enjoy this world like I used to? How can I desire the things that I used to desire? How can I have the same ambitions that I used to have? I can't. <laughs> God ruined it for me. Right? He stole my heart through the work of Jesus Christ. He stole my heart. So I thank my Father. I give glory to Him. I appreciate Him so much. And I honor the name of Jesus. And I exalt His name. Thank you. I hope that you were blessed. I hope that you were touched. And I hope that I truly pray and, 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 be, and hope that this will accentuate your life with God and your walk with Christ. And may the Lord bless you 
and keep you and protect you in these tough times. And may you love the Lord your God with all your heart and understanding.